All right, I'm going to start. Uh, the title, uh, I'm not entirely sure of, but uh, it's good enough for today. So this is uh, what we typically think of collages, right? Uh, kind of a cut and paste practice. Uh, this is this uh, famous, hilarious collage done by Richard Hamilton in 56. Uh, and we know things like this from like, uh, you know, work of Archigram, Super Studio, early Rem Kohlhaas, and uh, uh, although uh, we may not be entirely aware of the art history, uh, uh, this kind of uh, image making practice was a very uh, developed uh, thing in the air. Uh, it really uh, uh, begins, you can't talk about collage with, without first talking about Picasso and Brock. Uh, so the word collage itself is attributed to one of them. There was a kind of uh, dispute about which of the two came up with the term. Uh, the term uh, uh, is a, uh, really a neologism and it comes from uh, the French uh, colère uh, to glue, quite, quite literally, to paste. So this kind of cut and paste uh, world we live in, it really begins here. Uh, although in other visual cultures outside of Europe, uh, there are uh, minor examples of uh, making things from other things. Uh, there are some curious examples from Chinese uh, art and so on, but uh, really for uh, what we think collage is and in the historical discipline we're in, this really begins with Picasso and Brock. And uh, uh, the word uh, uh, collage itself as coming from colère uh, to glue is, is quite interesting, you know, to put together. On some level, maybe on a more philosophical level, I suppose you could say all art is a practice of making things from other things. Uh, if it's uh, like grinding bone to make white paint or cutting down a tree and planing it to make a chair, uh, everything essentially has to come from something else. So in that sense uh, that you're appropriating something and making it into something else, it's, it's, it's really uh, art itself. You know? But uh, aside from the generalist kind of philosophical point of view, which uh, frankly I don't think we need to care about that. Uh, the, the actual problem really begins in the distinction between analytical versus synthetic cubism. So uh, uh, just a kind of uh, brief refresher in Art History 101, uh, you know, the analytical cubism is uh, you pick up something, you look at it from this point, look at it from this point, that, and from all the different kind of viewpoints, you're kind of compiling it to make a kind of uh, composite view of the multiple uh, 2D views of a three-dimensional object. And uh, that's what you see here on the left. Uh, this is the famous one uh, by Picasso, which is a portrait of an uh, art dealer, a uh, very famous art dealer, Ambrose Villard. And, and then on the right, and, and this, this is a very brief period, a uh, period of uh, uh, analytical cubism uh, lasts really no more than, say, four years. Uh, it's, it's hard to do the precise dating because uh, they didn't put dates on their paintings and Picasso and Brock and their rivalry changed the dates and Picasso would uh, kind of uh, like uh, subtract one year to make it look like he did it before Brock and so on, you know, so it's hard to actually know exactly who did what. But uh, it's in the kind of dialogue uh, that kind of emerges in Cubism, uh, this is more or less when it happens in the period of uh, 1908 to uh, 1912. Uh, then, uh, uh, and again, we don't know exactly who does it first, uh, they start doing something weird. Uh, they start pasting like a piece of string or a fake wood grain and applying it to the canvas. Uh, and this is when uh, we first see uh, the use of this term collage to collare, to literally glue some object from the world onto the painting. And this is the period referred to as synthetic cubism. Okay, so uh, there are, uh, uh, at, this is kind of an interesting one that I always appreciated. Uh, these composite Polaroids by David Hockney, uh, clearly uh, a reference to Picasso because it is uh, an image of a blue guitar. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the joke here is uh, it's kind of cubism done with, uh, with Polaroids. 
So the incorporation of the kind of ready-made of the photographic object uh, is a very interesting kind of joke, if you will. Uh, and then there are other ver versions. Uh, now, there's an issue here, I think, uh, between uh, uh, discontinuous uh, composites versus continuous composites. So this is a very interesting uh, case in point in contrast to the Hockney. Okay, uh, let's see, where are my notes? Yeah, so this is uh, Nancy Burson uh, in 1982. She was working uh, at MIT and developing uh, the first uh, algorithmic, uh, I guess, uh, tools for blending uh, images together. So uh, what you see here in 1982, okay, and the date is important, uh, you'll see it uh, in a second, because what this is is a composite of, uh, uh, it's called Warhead, by the way. And uh, the, the, I guess the, the, the idea here is, let's take the nuclear stockpiles of all the countries, uh, reduce it to percentage, and then I'm going to translate it to the image of the leader of that country. So it's 55% Ronald Reagan, 45% Brezhnev. There's, uh, she claims there's 1% Margaret Thatcher in there, which I don't quite see, you know, blah, 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 right? So it's the first uh, kind of uh, example of maybe what you would call a kind of uh, automated or mechanical collaging. And uh, it results in a possibility for continuous collaging, uh, which is a term I'm just inventing for today. Uh, the seamlessness is quite interesting, and it's quite striking relative to uh, the kind of things we're living with right now. Uh, to give you some idea, uh, uh, I also did this little quick thing this morning where I use Google to do a little search for visually similar images. Okay. I don't know if any of you uh, uh, have played with uh, this uh, thing called Face App, where you can artificially age yourself. Uh, uh, me and my friends have been having some fun with that. Uh, uh, it's, it's quite uncanny, uh, uh, and what you'll see when you use this app is uh, it won't work if you don't have an internet connection because what it's doing is it's taking the picture, uploading it to the database, to the central server, where a convolutional, a deep learning convolutional neural net is running, searching through uh, millions of faces. And then it's trying to find a match between the face that's being uploaded and the faces that are possibly matching in the database, and then it does a blend between the two. This is uh, how Google image search works. Uh, convolutional neural nets are fascinating, uh, just as a concept. And uh, uh, what, what interests me about it for today is it is a kind of collage problem. Okay? And this is where it gets tricky for us. Do we want to call that collage or not? Okay? What's the difference? Once it becomes a continuous collage, is it still a collage, and do we need a new word? Uh, obviously, a lot of this has to do, uh, and sometimes it escapes our notice, but you have to notice that all of this is dependent on mechanical reproduction of images. It depends on photography. So moving uh, to a different uh, area of our practice, uh, uh, this is uh, Bernd and Hilla Bescher, uh, who famously were uh, the kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, intellectual leaders of what's now known as the Dusseldorf School of Photography. Uh, the Dusseldorf School, uh, the Dusseldorf Kunst Academy, is uh, probably the most important school of photography and perhaps uh, fine arts in general in the past 50 years. This is where Gerhard Richter was, and uh, from this photo photography program came uh, the most important photographers of today, like Thomas Struth, uh, Thomas Ruff, uh, uh, and of course, uh, Andreas Gursky. Uh, and then Thomas Demand is also coming out of there. Uh, so uh, take a look at this uh, uh, first masterpiece by Andreas Gursky. Uh, this is uh, all the way back in 1993. Uh, 
It is uh, called uh, Montparnasse uh, Perry. And uh, uh, the joke here, of course, the commentary is uh, uh, Montparnasse is, of course, where Hemingway was the expatriate hanging out, where the cafes are, I mean, real bohemian, elite, uh, kind of artistic community area. And look at it now. Gigantic, nasty, modernist housing block. So uh, to call it, uh, you know, to focus on that part of uh, Europe, this part of Paris, and to show this image is quite a astounding kind of, uh, uh, I guess, a narrative about what uh, modernism is. And uh, uh, what Gursky started doing in this photograph was uh, highly controversial. Uh, he embraced digital manipulation. Uh, this photograph, uh, which is quite large, and the size is important, because uh, making it uh, gigantic uh, uh, it, it is in some ways playing into the problem of whether or not photography constitutes a fine art. It's a limited edition of six also, so you, you won't uh, be allowed to make another print from the negatives or so on. Uh, however, uh, he goes beyond the problem of the negative here because he takes uh, two photographs on medium format, so you get a very large negative, scans them immediately and spent a year doing heavy digital manipulation to the image and then composited them in order to capture in a somewhat uncanny way uh, an impossible condition of light because uh, the light and shadow conditions come from two different pictures. Uh, and this is how large it is. Uh, the second, uh, I guess, famous uh, masterpiece by Gursky, uh, and this is the painting that broke all records by uh, selling uh, for $4.3 million at an auction in 2006. Uh, this is called Rhine uh, Number no. 2. Uh, this is a follow-up to a picture of the Rhine, uh, which is right across the street from the Dusseldorf Kunst Academy uh, that uh, he uh, took uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, now, what's remarkable about this picture is it's not one location in the Rhine. It's multiple locations in the Rhine. And also, all evidence of human activity has been, I guess you would say, photoshopped out. So this is a typical image of uh, the Rhine, uh, one of the locations where he took the picture. So in some sense, you could say it's both a kind of a it's a one, uh, like I said, a continuous collage, right? Seamlessness is uh, important in contrast to the kind of celebration of discontinuity in, say, the work of Richard Hamilton or even uh, Brock and Picasso, that uh, this kind of uh, revealing that it's coming from multiple locations and being piled onto a single image plane is being kind of tossed out. And now there's a concerted effort to produce a, a composite, a seamlessness, a single totality, a coherent image. But there's also uh, an odd thing going on here of maybe, I don't know if you call it a kind of negative collage or a reverse collage, where it's also erasing things, taking away things. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, the most famous of his more recent paintings, uh, of, oops, I call it a painting. Maybe I should call it a painting. Photographs. Uh, uh, people, when they looked at Rhine II, uh, often commented uh, its similarity to the paintings of Barnett Newman. And uh, this aggravated Gursky quite a bit. And he uh, kind of uh, does a kind of fuck you uh, back, uh, where he, uh, this is a photograph of the four living German chancellors staring at a Barnett Newman painting. Yeah. Uh, now, the key here is. Uh, uh, the Barnett Newman painting uh, uh, obviously is not uh, there in front of the German chancellors. It's entirely Photoshop, you know, carefully photo. In fact, the four chancellors were not sitting together. He photographed them separately. Right? So what kind of uh, image is this? Do we want to keep calling this a collage? You know, what is the, uh, uh, the value of this form of practice? Right? So, here, I'm going to bore you by reading you something, a couple of things. Uh, this is from uh, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction by Walter Benjamin, 1936. 
Uh, if you haven't read it, I, I think this is assigned in probably half the syllabi here in the school, you know, but if you haven't read it, you really have to read this thing. Uh, it's, uh, I first read it all the way back in 94, and I've been reading it ever since. Unbelievably rich. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, one might assume the eliminated element in the term aura and go on to say, that which withers in the age of mechanical reproduction is the aura of the work of art. This is a symptomatic process whose significance points to the realm of art. One might generalize by saying the technique of reproduction detaches the reproduced object from the domain of tradition. So, the point here is uh, uh, we all want authentic work, we want original work, but uh, his basic point is uh, mechanized reproduction of the original uh, makes the aura of that original, the power of that original wither. Every time you copy it, its uh, original kind of power and force diminishes. Uh, I would go so far as to say now that we're in the age of Google image search, there's nearly nothing left at all of the aura of the original. Uh, in fact, maybe nothing. Right. So what is left of artistic practices then in the age of maybe now digital reproduction, which is a kind of hyper intense kind of acceleration of mechanical reproduction. And I think the work of, uh, say, Gursky is uh, an incredibly vital, significant form of artistic practice uh, in this kind of milieu. Uh, so here, here's a number of things I've been collecting over the years uh, that I find related to this problem and that I find fascinating. Uh, this is a group, a, a collective of four uh, artists that are, uh, the idea is, uh, 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 satellite photographs of scenes from the Bible. So this is uh, uh, what the, the parting of the Red Sea looks like on Google Earth. Uh, of course, all seamless collage, all continuous collage. You, you obvious, uh, I, I hope you can figure out what that one is. This one's supposed to be the Garden of Eden, and this one's my personal favorite, uh, Noah's Ark. Yeah. Again, keep in mind, what, what is the significance of this in the age of uh, digital reproduction? When the aura of the original is no longer of any importance, we're just left with an enormous, seemingly infinite junk pile of, uh, of reproductions. Where is the original? What is authentic? Maybe it doesn't matter anymore. What do you do with this crap? What do you do with the surfeit of uh, endless uh, imagery around us? What kind of practices might we have? Uh, here's Heidi Hatchery, who makes flowers out of animal parts. Uh, so you could, it's a kind of weird case of collage, uh, taking uh, awful parts, kind of thrown away parts of animal after they're slaughtered and collaging them into a seamless uh, collage of uh, what looks like flowers. So there's obviously some pretty extreme radical feminist discourses associated with this, et cetera. You can sort of see the pig ear. All right. This is a sheep penis collaged onto a cow's vagina. Uh, moving from the ridiculous to the sublime, Cedric Del So uh, carefully photoshops characters from Star Wars into burnt out, kind of seemingly realistic uh, urban environments. <laughs> My favorite right here. And you could do minimalism too, I suppose. Right? <laughs> Clay Lipsky uh, uh, was obsessed with photographing tourists looking at stuff and also for some reason was collecting uh, uh, government photographs of nuclear tests until one day he decided to combine the two. This one's pretty cool. Yeah. And you may uh, have heard of this guy, Philippe Dujardin, who was an architectural photographer uh, collecting a vast uh, archive of his own kind of uh, architectural photography jobs until one day he decides to cut out pieces of it and make new buildings. But again, seamlessness, continuous com composites. This one's probably the great MVR DV that MVR DV never did. Yeah. <laughs> 
This one's really nice. Yeah. Too bad Marcelo's not here. He would like this one. <laughs> Philip Scherer, uh, he was the uh, in-house renderer for Herzog and Demarok until he went out on, the own and, uh, on his own and started making these odd composites. Uh, these are not obviously real buildings, but enormous attention to adding things like little dirt and you know, dirt at the base. Again, for lack of a better term, we would say uh, they're collages. Right? But if we don't want to call it a collage, because obviously this is all about erasing every, any evidence that something has been glued together, we might need another word. Yeah, there's quite a lot. There's 25 of these. Keep going. OK. So I'm going to end by reading you one more thing. Uh, this is an essay by Jacques Ranciere called Problems and Transformations of Critical Art that's in Aesthetics and Its Discontents. Fantastic book about uh, the kind of, maybe a, anybody who might be interested in engaging politics through aesthetics should uh, study Ranciere carefully. Uh, this is just the beginning. Uh, he says something about maybe why uh, critical art is horribly misguided and why collage uh, or what we've been calling collage might have some significance when it comes to uh, political engagement. Uh, he writes, uh, in its most general expression, uh, critical art is a type of art that sets out to build awareness of the mechanisms of domination and turn the spectator into a conscious agent of world transformation. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna have to translate uh, some of it because he writes in a bizarre way. But uh, uh, critical art uh, for, uh, is essentially turning the, the beholder into something that's uh, subconscious and aware of the milieu they're in, uh, the predicament we're in. Uh, I might not know I'm being exploited until critical art shows me that I'm being exploited. The quandary that plagues the project is well known. On the one hand, understanding does not, in and of itself, help to transform intellectual attitudes and situations. So uh, just because you make one aware that they're being exploited, you haven't done anything to help them stop being exploited. So uh, I, I'm deeply sympathetic to that sentence because I, I'm really sick and tired of work that raises awareness. Like, who gives a shit? Uh, we already know. We already know the problem we're in. Uh, on the other hand, under, uh, I just read that. The exploited rarely require an explanation of the laws of exploitation. I think that's just hilarious and obvious. Uh, the dominated do not remain in subordination because they misunderstand the existing state of affairs, but because they lack confidence in the capacity to transform it. Now, the feeling of such a capacity presupposes that the dominated are already committed to a political process in a bid, bid to change already committed to a political process, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading it over, in a bid to change the configuration of the sensory givens and to construct forms of a world to come from within the existing world. So he's alluding to ultimately what's necessary is a transformation of the existing world, obviously. On the other hand, the work which builds understanding and dissolves appearances kills by, do, by doing so the strangeness of the resistant appearance that attests to the non-necessary or intolerable character of the world. So uh, it, the very estrangement that might be some form of possibility of art in transforming the world gets killed by kind of uh, developing this uh, critical self-awareness of it. Insofar as it asks the viewers to discover the signs of capital behind everyday objects and behaviors, critical art, and I could uh, also substitute for critical art socially engaged architecture here, uh, critical art risks being inscribed in the perpetuity of a world in which the transformation of things into signs is redoubled by the very excess of interpretive signs which brings things to lose their capacity for resistance. So the point there, uh, and that's where I'll stop, is uh, the critical, uh, 
politically engaged practice itself uh, inevitably devolves into a signifier, at which point it loses any capacity to uh, produce social change. So the real tension here is between the domain of art and the domain of not art, and what could possibly bridge between and transform one with the other. And uh, later on in the essay, this is uh, what he uh, starts uh, being curious uh, about uh, with regards to collage, because like Picasso bringing in the chair caning into the canvas, it's bringing in a piece of the world of the non-art into the domain of art, and then vice versa by then putting it back out into the world. So these seamless or continuous collages in some sense is a kind of estrangement or making weird of uh, reality that we already know because it's taking images and photographs, recordings of the thing that's, that are already out there and bringing it into a domain of the not real, which is artistic practice. And then it goes back out again. We send it back out again. So like that image of Gursky of the four German chancellors staring at the Barnett Newman, it's a very strange act to put that image then back into the world and it sells for $4.3 million. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'll end. Okay. That was interesting. Um, first, thanks for the invitation. And, and of course, uh, I think it was great that David started because I guess what I thought I, I'm going to do, since I seem to be obviously the guy who has to come in when the city is on call, yeah? Um, then what I'm going to do is I basically want Nobody to show... <laughs> Sorry? It's not that you're that good. It's nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Monopoly. So, well, but what I want to show is, basically, is the idea that what David showed in the first slide yeah, that I would consider as the predominant idea of the collage technique that suddenly something from somewhere moves into something else, yeah, that kind of problem I consider I would like to show you as an urban practice. And I want to concentrate in principle just actually on three projects that I think are crucial to the understanding to me what has happened. Yeah? Um, I'm not going to show you something that has happened today, but I guess the three examples summarize basically our current stage and which raises the question, I think, that I think David came to the end, what would be now the real political intention that if you do collage today? Yeah? Uh, so to start with, I would argue first, and I think something that I once heard from Graham Harmon, who said there is every content comes within a form and therefore every form has a content, yeah? So when I understood the collage, then I always thought, to my understanding, that that what you call the signifier, yeah? Is that what is, if I think it's physical form, and the signified is that what if it's, is its content, yeah? And I want to show you how these two ideas sort of for me played out within the history of architecture that I'm going to show you on three projects. Now the first one is, I think we all know, is the Collage City, yeah? And we refer to as that example of we understand what urban practice would mean to the idea of the collage. But what I would argue here is that what going, what's going on in that work is that when uh, Colin Rowe shows his project, he basically argues the content lies in the form and therefore, the form becomes an independent entity to which I can do anything with. Mm? So here's the story. The story goes, uh, the pre-modern city, as you can see, uh, knows exactly what its form looks like, you know? And then we have the modern city, and these two kind of oppositions are basically the confrontation that we have to deal with today. And so the question will be, how do you unify them? So for the first one, it was clear that the content of the middle, the pre-modern city was clear that what you consider as public space, yeah, you can identify as an entity 
and what you could call the inhabitable space is that what serves the public. Yeah? And there was an understanding that the content of the city, so if you were to ask someone in the Middle Age, why do you live there? It was totally clear the content why we live there is because God tells us you know, what to do. But the same thing was also within the 19th century, it still was clear what the boulevard meant. Because the boulevard, as we know from the work of Richard Sennett, was the idea of public man and life and so on, and architecture just serves it. So what Colin Rowe does now, he just says you can reduce that content to one form of problem, and that is that what you could call the content becomes basically the figure, which is our idea of public, and what comes architecture is just the ground, yeah? and as we know, he relates that back to the knowledge project. And then he says, then the other problem is, of course, the modern city, and what you can see in the modern city here in the Plan Voisin, or what is called then later on, basically the tower in the park, just considers out of a different form of problem, which is basically the figure becomes a tower and the void becomes the ground. So what it meant in principle is that once I have detached the content from the form, or basically I have translated the form yeah, away from the content, the form allows me now to become a floating signifier and become uh, played with. Yeah? And I think that's what I would call is the critical practice. Well, we know this relates to the idea of the Berenese. So what now Colin Rowe does is he shows that both of them basically have to be unified, and he uses a word, I think in his book he calls it bricolage, yeah? um, which in principle is the idea that you can argue that by collaging these two formal problems together, I unify basically the postmodern city. So here, here is the content reduced to the formal problem, and now what he does in principle, he produces a new formal diagram, which he calls the Pochet. So the Pochet now is, in principle, a collage. Yeah, I think in, the, in a certain way you could say it's a discontinuous collage you know, from the two other formal problems in which architecture should solve now that problem to unify these two formal problems before. It should behave as a figure and it should behave as a ground at the same time. Yeah? And so he comes with this very famous diagram of the Bellagio Borghese where he says, in principle, look at this. This is what architecture actually should do. Architecture should on the one hand side be the ground for a public void space so that it can introduce the public as a collective entity, but at the same time it should be ground to an outside of it. Now, why I'm showing that is because what I meant by having the form detached from the content, he braces suddenly in his book projects that are 200, 500 years later in Russia in the 1930s, where suddenly this collective or this content of the collective totally disappeared, but just the form became the signifier to play with. So for example, this is the famous project of Gus Barrow for the uh, uh, Soviet palace, and what he likes it, because he likes it because architecture produces this public square. But the public, the content of the square, meaning the middle age uh, idea of publicness is of course gone because we are living in Russia in the 1920s of total uh, modernist utopia. Yeah? So this is, that's why I wanted to show it. I want to show you that the formalist project to me detached the content from its form and made now suddenly the form as a floating signifier as we know from the work of Eisenman. Now why I mean this is because that's what I think happened uh, to the formalist when it comes to a critical project because what happened now is I played on a formal level with this idea that that floating uh, form carries on an inherent content to which I um, sort of play a formal practice that inherits a content that is not there. Now this is the famous example from uh, the Repstock project and to my understanding what uh, Eisenman does here, he takes now the modern and the pre-modern city resembled by the modern city as the idea of the slab, yeah? and the pre-modern city by the idea of the block, oh sorry, by the idea of the block, and what he does now is he basically unifies them both yeah? and tries to make aware that in the figure there is the content of the, the lost awareness of a publicness, and in the ground there's the lost awareness of the other content. So to me, that project of the formalist in basically um, 
uh, incorporated the idea that content somehow could be detached from its form and form became its own signifying element. Now, when this was the first project, and I think the second project, I would argue, is the Delirious New York, which I would call the opposite. What Collas does, and if you look at this, this is the um, uh, famous collage on the captive globe, but if you look very carefully, and I just read it recently uh, in relationship to Ungas, what he does now is the opposite. He makes the content as a floating signifier and argues that any content can be put into any form. And what he shows to me in this collage is that he shows the block, uh, basically the formal diagram of the city, yeah? or you could even say it's a blimp with a tower on the top. And what he shows now that any kind of ideology can be put into these forms. Yeah? And I think uh, if you look now, this is an example he published in the 1970s, where you can see exactly what is all in there. So there is futurist ideologies, Dadaism, surrealism, social realism, uh, communism, uh, capitalism, any kind of ideology of form, uh, content, can be put into any of these forms. Now, which is interesting because, of course, he was interested in this idea that um, there is a kind of uh, social entity yeah, to which I think um, is the content of architecture. Well, I, I just showed this, this is kind of a, uh, <laughs> usually Kolha shows always naked people that are gay. Uh, I always, I'm always showing it the uh, naked people of Otto Mühl outside of Vienna, because there were 1,300 uh, 1, of them, which was basically a sex commune, yeah, which was the idea that it, it didn't matter for them that they were in a, in a country house. Yeah? Yeah, they could also go in a high rise. Yeah? Yeah, so, yeah. As long as uh, the content stayed alive. Yeah? Mm. I, I don't know if you know the content, in the end it was content rich. <laughs> content rich. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what Kohlhaas then did is he just chose them to me in the kind of uh, delirious New York to say, I take now the content of the welfare state as my political idea of understanding architecture and move it now into each block. So having said that, what I wanted to show is that that kind of collage will suddenly be a collage, not of forms to me, but of forms of content free of its uh, form. Now, having, the reason why um, I've said that because I think what uh, the work of Jumi that I think came to now to me much more aware in this idea of the collage is because I guess that what Jumi shows us yeah, is what I could call the current condition of collage techniques in which form and content are free floating signifiers and they can become anything they want. Yeah? So this is a little bit the context. So for uh, Manhattan Transcript, he frames the word of detourment, uh, which I think uh, many of you know as a technique of Dadaism and Surrealism. And it especially goes uh, with this idea of the political of the collage. And so I think for him, the, he mentions it, there's a minor and absurd, um, abusive detourment. And what he argues is the minor detourment is very simple. I just take an element from its context yeah, and just put it into something else. yeah. So it, what it does, it, it's losing its meaning or it's losing the context. But what he really likes is the ab abusive determinant because now what he does is by arguing that I can take something out and put it into something else, I can produce another form of meaning that suddenly becomes a political awareness. You know? And he argues that actually abusive determinants are mostly assemblages or collages. Yeah? of marginal ones. So for example, famous one, this one, yeah, the Pepsi one, yeah, uh, the sugar guy, you know, the Vietnam guy. Yeah. So in the Manhattan transcript, what I think uh, Jumi does now, he argues that what you consider as architecture already could be a collage of three different things. You know, he calls it the world of the objects. These are the world of our buildings. Yeah? The world of our movements. This you could call infrastructure. And then the worlds of events. And what he does now is, by introducing the idea of the murder, of course, you know, everyone who comes from the 60s needs a kind of irrational Freudian subject, you know. Yeah? So he needed the murder. Yeah? The, the murder who sort of uh, gets rid of the grid. Yeah? 
But what he really shows now is that with bringing the murder in, he now actually wants to argue, look what happens here. Uh, the murder is using the space differently. He's using the street differently. Yeah? Uh, he's using the building differently, you know? And then basically he reuses the tower differently. But what, after the introduction, you see, when I had to have this lecture, I thought I understood what this manifesto is about. But when you read the first two pages, there are really coming then the confusing images, and I try to reconstruct them for you. Yeah? They have, uh, they look like this. What Chumi was interested in is that he not only argued that a uh, program is event and object, what he really wanted to argue is how can you position a political statement within post-structuralism? Hmm? Meaning that if the, everything has lost their meaning and its form and they become a floating signifier, what's then, what's then the practice is about? So this is a, a, uh, what he started. He was interested in the idea to say, well, we can actually argue we have two forms of series of events. We can say we have always the same object or we can say we have an object who moves from one into the other. And this is the diagram that I think to me is uh, interesting. He argues now that what you could say is I, in the world of objects, I have different architecture. In the words of movement, I have different movement. In the world of events, and then I think he does um, the most interesting diagram that I want to summarize my lecture because I think this kind of diagram is my idea of the three images of I showed you before. So for him, I think modernism meant that if I have an architecture that is the bridge, that bridge has a particular movement walking from one to the other side yeah, and basically produces an event. So this is a kind of functional homogeneity of relationships in which form and content yeah, uh, are unified. Then he says, uh, and I think this is what I think uh, uh, Kohlhaus and uh, in a certain way wrote it, yeah, is if I take now, for example, a bridge, I can take a movement that is contradictionary to that bridge. Yeah? That's, for example, dancing, can put dancing onto the bridge, yeah? and therefore produce an event that the bridge didn't incorporate. And then he said, but in post-structuralism, yeah, anything can become anything. Yeah? And then he says, I think very beautiful, the building can behave like a dancer, yeah? the <laughs> movement can behave like a building, and the uh, event can be happen like a diagram. Yeah. And so what happens is, he says that in the end, uh, whereby movement, objects, and event become fully interchangeable, where people behave as walls, where walls behave as dang dance dangos, and dangos become offices. Yeah? That's, I think, the condition in which we are. And so I, I show you now a kind of a last image where I think you can see that I would argue that the current stage in which I think all the practices things thing have to relate today is that when I can move content, when content and uh, form become a floating signifier and everything can move into each other, yeah? the question is, you know, what kind of uh, collages are we going to do next? Thank you very much.